This is the RAM sim for my new computer. And this is the power cable. And today, we're going to write some code for it. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, I'm going to show you how we used to do it in the olden days. And by it, I mean writing and loading our own code onto a big computer like my PDP-1134 all the way from 1976. It might not seem like a big deal now, but this was a serious machine in its day. Whereas the microcomputers of that era might have had a 1 MHz CPU and 4K of RAM, the PDP runs at 15 MHz and has 256K of RAM. And with the right operating system installed, it's a real-time, multi-user, multitasking, data center heating machine. The problem is the complexity. I mean, where do you even start with one? There's no small book like the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Manual. In fact, the reference manual for the RSX 11M operating system takes up about four linear feet of bookshelf. And that's just for the OS, never mind the system or the hardware. When I was a teenager, I knew a set of bohemian programmers named Roy, Gary, and Roe who lived in a small wood frame house near my high school campus, and they seemed to divide their time between the grow lab in the basement and the PDP-11 running BSD Unix in their living room. They were cross-assembling code for Commodore 64 games on their PDP, and the whole process was nearly akin to magic to me. I wouldn't have even known where to start with the thing. And so today, I want to remove those layers of mystery that surround the big iron machines like this. So I thought perhaps the best way to approach it would be to start with something we all likely know and understand and then dive deeper and closer to the hardware with each step until we're running raw machine code on the bare metal. As an official dilettante, once we've done that, we can claim victory over to the machine and carve a new notch in our flowchart template, as was the style at the time. Back when I was in school, if you took the equivalent of CS50 or whatever they would have called it back then, you were likely writing basic programs through a serial terminal connected to a PDP-11 running RT-11 or similar. And so that's where we'll start today. We're going to party like it's 1979. To get up and running, we need to first boot the machine. Once the power has come up and stabilized, we press the initialize button on the front of the machine while holding the unlock button, and the machine should drop into a machine language monitor on the console terminal. I'll then load the boot sector code into memory and jump to it, which should kick off the operating system load. Once the RT11 system is loaded, we'll start basic and then enter a program and run it. One difference is that I can load the boot sector code right into memory with my Unibone card, which plugs into the bus and so it can see and modify the system memory. Without that, we'd need a paper tape reader or some other input device to load this boot sector. But thanks to the Unibone, we're all set. Let's have a look at the process to start the machine and write some code. To boot into RT11, I'll go into the Unibone and run the script, which launches that configuration. And then I'll have to head over and hit an it on the front panel. When I do that, we'll see the drive spin up, and we can type MLL to load the bootloader into memory. We'll go to address 10,000 in Octal. I'll do an examine to make sure it looks right, which it does. And as soon as I hit start, RT11 springs to life. I'll run basic from the DL1 drive, and I'll ask for all functions. My code will loop A from 1 to 10,000, stepping by 0.2, and it will use the sign of that value to calculate the tab distance over at which to print the character. So the tab distance will be centered around 35, and will swing up to 35 in either direction, depending on the sign of the current value for A. I'll then save my masterpiece, and we can run it. And when we do, we get a wonderful sine wave curve going back and forth across the screen, tabbing between 0 and 70. Yeah, would you look at that? That's some pretty nice 9600 baud effects. They just don't make them like they used to. Well, that's all well and good, and it even looks kind of pretty, but it's still just basic. I know my audience wouldn't respect me if I didn't bust out the assembly language on a machine like this, and so, as the good book says, it's time to put away the childish things and write some serious code. Well, a serious hello world, maybe, but at least it'll be an assembly. Now, I'll be honest, the PDP-11 architecture has my favorite instruction set of all time. Probably the closest PC architecture would have been the 68000 series of chips in the early Macs and Amigas, whose instruction set was clearly influenced by the PDP. It also highly informed the design of the x86 chips, even if the grammar is quite different. Let's take a minute so I can give you a little overview of programming an assembly for the PDP. If you have a grasp of any other assembly language, you're in for a treat. It all starts with the registers. 
unlike say the 6502 where you get one accumulator and two index registers and they're all eight bits, the PDP-11 brings us eight general purpose registers and they're all a full 16 bits. The registers are named R0 through R7. The first six, R0 to R5, are used for general purposes, meaning you can use them in any way that your program requires. The seventh register, R6, is the stack pointer, commonly abbreviated as SP. This register is crucial for stack operations managing the memory area where data is stored temporarily. The eighth register, R7, is the program counter, abbreviated as PC, which holds the address of the next instruction to be executed. Now let's discuss how to move values in PDP-11 assembly. The instruction to transfer data is MOV, which of course stands for move. The move instruction allows you to move data between registers or between registers and memory. And the syntax is straightforward. You specify the source and then the destination. For example, move R0 comma R1 will move the value in R0 to R1. If you want to move a value from memory to a register, you might use something like move at R1 to R2, which moves the value at the memory address pointed to by R1 into R2. You notice this is the correct order for source and destination. I still struggle with x86 and its weird backwards order, even after all these years. On the PDP-11, you move something from a place to a new place. Now, let's look at how to manipulate memory directly. The PDP-11 assembly language provides several ways to access and modify memory contents. You can use the move instruction to load data from a memory address into a register or store data from a register into a memory address. For example, move parentheses R0 comma R1 loads the value from the memory address in R0 into R1, whereas move R1 to in parentheses R0 stores the value in R1 into the memory address specified by R0. Calling subroutines in PDP-11 assembly is another fundamental operation. Subroutines, of course, are blocks of code that perform specific tasks and that can be called from different places in your program. The JSR instruction, which stands for jump to subroutine, is used for this purpose. For example, JSR R5, comma, subroutine label will jump to the labeled address subroutine label using R5 as a temporary register. Finally, returning from a subroutine is done using the RTS instruction, which stands for return from subroutine. Now, the best grade I ever achieved in college was a 99 in CS310, which was our assembly language and machine architecture class, based around the PDP-11s that we had on campus. Even though it's been a solid 30 years since I did any Macro 11 assembly, as it's commonly known, it all came back pretty quickly. One haunting memory I have comes from an earlier assembly language class, I think it was like CS240, where I was writing the final exam, and I got everything right except for one question. Are you ready for that question? Every JSR requires an RTS. I said yes. The answer is no, because many JSRs can share one RTS, and therefore I was wrong. And so RTS haunts me to this day. Let's have a look at what it takes to write a Hello World application in assembly language for RT11 on the PDP-1134. Okay, let's write a version for RT11. We'll start off with giving it a title. We'll call it the Hello World. And we'll use two system calls, TTY out and exit. So we have to list those up front. Hello is our main entry point. And we're gonna move the address of our message into R1. We're going to move the byte pointed to at R1 and post increment into R0. If it's a zero byte, we branch to done, print the character with TTY out, and branch back to a label that I have to go back and define, one dollar sign, there we go. And when we're done, we exit. We'll define the string and then we'll end the program. And as soon as I'm done, I'll save it in the shared folder that's visible from RT11. And sure enough, if I do a dir of test, I can see test.asm. I'm gonna delete anything here on the local drive first, and I'm going to assemble the test.asm, which should produce a new OBJ file. I can then link that test.obj, and then we can run test.save, and we get our hello world from Dave's garage. Now, most people would call that bare metal programming, but we've still got an operating system and the program assembler and linker and launcher involved. There are still lots of layers of abstraction still involved here, and I want to go deeper and closer to the hardware. For example, to output text on the terminal, we relied on the TTY out system call, a bit of a black magic box that somehow prints information for us. But how? What if we wanted to run right on the bare metal with no operating system? Well, that's precisely what we're going to do next. We're going to use the PDP-11 GUI program to assemble our Hello World program to bytes and then poke them directly into memory in a freshly booted empty system at address 2000. We'll then set the program counter to 2000 and we'll press the big run button and our program will run on the hardware directly with no operating system or anything else between us and the hardware. 
That does beg the question, though, of how we're going to do text output without the help of the operating system. What we're going to do is to poke our output characters directly into the hardware registers of the PDP-11 serial card itself. And thanks to the way that PDP-11 is architected, the DL-11 serial card always lives in memory at the same address on all systems. So we know exactly where it is in memory, and all we have to do is feed it our text. Let's take a look at the ultimate way to program a PDP-11, bare metal. Here in PDP-11 GUI, we can see the green on black text is our serial console to the PDP-11. And here is our assembly language source code window. And the only bit of magic in this code is the base address of the DL11 serial card, which is at 177.560hex. That's where we know the card lives in memory, and it's always there as long as it's present. And since I guess you need a console to operate, I'm guessing it's always present. Our setup will be comprised of loading the base address of the serial card plus 4, which is the transmitter section of the card, into the register R2. Next, we load the address of our string into R1. Here's where we fetch the next character from memory and store it in a register. The parentheses around R1 indicate that we're actually talking about the memory pointed to by R1, so we're going to move whatever's at the memory address pointed to by R1 into the register R0, and the plus sign means we post increment the R1 register. And if the character we just pulled out of memory is null or zero, we'll branch if equal to our done. And to actually transmit the character, we'll take our zero, which currently holds the value of the character we want to transmit, and we store it two bytes into the transmitter section of the D11 serial card. That, just doing that, storing the value there, will cause it to begin being transmitted. And so in this wait loop, we're going to branch on plus, which means as long as the high bit is not set, we branch back to wait, and we keep doing that until the high bit is in fact set, which will cause branch plus to fail and not branch, and that high bit tells us that the character has been transmitted. As soon as it has, we branch unconditionally to the next character. And when we eventually hit that null terminator and branch to done, we're going to do a halt instruction, which will then loop back to start and start over again if the user presses the continue button to step past the halt on the front panel of the PDP-11. We can then deposit the result of the assembly directly into memory using the terminal. You can see it just flashed by there. Then we'll move down to the bottom. We'll set the load address to 2000. And we'll examine that to make sure it looks right, which it does. And as soon as we run it, we get our string, hello world. If you enjoy these little looks into retro coding, remember I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes. And these episodes are pretty niche. So I'd be honored if you'd consider leaving me one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, two things. First, thank you. And second, please check the button below to make sure you're still subscribed as YouTube does tend to inexplicably trim subscriptions from time to time. It happens. One of my other big projects this year was wrapping up my second book about the autism spectrum. It's intended for folks that do not have autism but who might share a few characteristics from the spectrum. It's everything I know now about living a successful life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago, and you can check out a free sample at the link in the video description. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.